Welcome back to another adventure in vintage telecommunications. So what I have out here are circuit boards for a system called the, uh, it was made by Northern Telecom. Um, they had a couple names for it. Uh, the SG-1, uh, they also called it the Pulse. Um, SG-1A was a slightly updated version of it. Um, this was uh, the first fully electronic private branch exchange ever. Um, so up until Northern Telecom produced uh, this system, this is just one specific card out of it, uh, things were largely electromechanical. Um, so this was kind of a, a big deal. Um, so this system is, uh, it has a, a digital control um, with uh, electronic call switching. Um, uh, and it uses, uh, it's time division multiplex, but it's an analog TDM system. Um, so it actually has something that's kind of like an analog T1. It samples uh, 8,000 times per second, um, but it, it just switches uh, the two ends of the call together um, 8,000 times a second and transfers the analog signal between each end and does some stuff to keep the signal there when it's not sampling. Uh, what do they call it? Um, something 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 with energy, resonant energy transfer. I should probably look that up. I'm guessing there's a patent. I've never thought to look for that. Anyway, this is a line card for the system. QPJ36A. You can't see that. It'll be out of focus if I stand it up. It's right there. QPJ36A. Style J. Uh, if this was a two line card line card for the system. Uh, the system was built almost entirely out of uh, 74 series TTL logic, um, which is neat because all these parts are still available. Right? Any of these ICs, I can go on DigiKey right now and order them and replace them, uh, which is kind of cool. Some of them, um, I might not be able to get the actual plain um, TTL. I have to get like a um, 74 LS series or something to replace them, but whatever. Um, they will most likely work. Um, but all replaceable, which is kind of cool, because um, some of these cards, this one's from 1978, um, but the system was made in the, the late 60s, I think, is when they were actually developing it. So cards come from all over the all over the calendar. Digital backplane, digital control. The CPU actually occupied an entire um, 36 inch wide, roughly I think 30 inch wide shelf of cards. Um, all full of uh, these kinds of ICs. Uh, this actually is interesting. Uh, what is this? Hmm. These have some um, thick film devices on them, which is, uh, I guess, pretty leading edge for the time. Here we go. Control shelf, the cards are just packed full of ICs, so all this would all be just the same. Um, 74 series. Uh, and the CPU isn't really a CPU. Well, it is. Uh, the CPU is specifically built for handling calls. It's specifically built for this system. Um, so this system, here's a, an example with some ugly ass decoupling ugh, capacitors. Um, this is actually the control shelf. This is a class of service select 40 line. This was part of the programming. So this system didn't have, it had read only memory uh, in the form of these. These are diode blocks. Um, there are a bunch of, it's a matrix of wires, and then these little things are built like a headphone jack. They have a tip and a ring, or a tip and a sleeve, I guess, with a diode inside the body. So you stuff that in there, you're actually putting a diode across a matrix. So they're a, what, 10 by 10 matrix. This is the electronics used to scan that matrix. Um, that's no good. But, uh, and do things with it. But the CPU wasn't, it's not like it's, you look at the CPU now with an instruction set in the bus, and um, this was, the instructions were hard-coded in these things, but it still had a clock. Uh, I think it ran at one megahertz, uh, I read somewhere. Um, uh, but it was, it was a clock controlling a bunch of logic that was all tied together, and uh, it was more of a, I guess, a sequencing system. Um, but it did have ROM, RAM, um, because it also had call state memory. Um, so, you know, 
I guess it's a computer. Anal or a digital back end, and then the the, uh, the side facing the telephones was, of course, analog. Uh, so that's what you can see on this board. You can see there's the digital guts here, and then kind of wrapped all the way around it are the analog bits and pieces for the phone, for the phone lines themselves. Um, so the transformers and things and rectifiers, I think that's a full wave rectifier there. Uh, relays and things. Um, so it was a, an interesting hybrid of, of digital and analog. Um, so this system, uh, the backplane, um, or these card edge connectors here, but the interesting thing is they had the speech highway connector, which is this little tiny two pin connector on a twisted pair that you put a shelf together, plug it in, um, uh, but then the speech highway you plugged in separately with this little tiny connector and I think it was a bit of marketing, um, you know, wow, all your calls are on this little tiny wire, which I guess is pretty cool at the time. Uh, I still think it's pretty cool. Anyway, that's a line card. Um, I've got, what's this? This is a, a conference amplifier. I'm going to guess that supports three conferences. Maybe. Because I see three of something going on here. Uh, or maybe six of something. Six, but this circuitry here is in threes and something died on this card. Um, we've seen the Digitone receiver. Uh, Touchtone being a trademark. Um, this is clearly not Touchtone. Very much digital. Um, it's interesting because this thick film stuff um, is the precursor to surface mount technology. Those are capacitors, and they look surprisingly similar to modern day surface mount capacitors. Uh, anyway, thick film technology. They use that, uh, I think, to remove a lot of um, consistency problems so they could focus on manufacturing these in a, in a more controlled manner. And then you could, you know, hire whoever to put the boards together. Um, yeah, what board is this? A Digitone receiver. Some specialized stuff there. Ah, let's go back to a conference amplifier for a minute. So these boards came a long way to get to me. They came from Florida. Um, the last time I was aware of their existence, they were in Ohio. Owned by the only other person I know on the planet that seems to care about this system. Uh... And uh, I don't know what happened to him, but his stuff ended up with another telephone collector in Florida who um, he just he couldn't hang on to the things anymore. So he scrapped the systems out, but I asked him to keep some specific cards for me because I didn't have them and they're hard to find. And I knew they'd been kind of beaten up and smashed up a little. So uh, these uh, are transformers, inductors with a variable adjustable core on them. And, um, I have a lot of boards where these are smashed to smithereens because they're really fragile and when people move the boards around and they're not properly packed, this is what happens. So they're cracked. But the neat thing is, and the really thing that fascinates me kind of about this system is that they're very maintainable because these are all, there's all off the shelf parts, there's no insane levels of integration. Uh, I can pick just about anything off of this, and if I can find a part number, I can get it off of DigiKey. Uh, in the case of these, I couldn't find a part number. They have Nortel specific. It's really hard to focus. Nortel specific part numbers. Um, so I spent a little while while waiting for the camera battery to charge, and look at what I found right there. You see that? Um, Epcos TDK uh, makes the cores for these transformers. Um, they've changed the physical shape a little. Um, I've been able to find some of these have N28 on them, um, which determines some of the characteristics of the ferrite. Uh, anyway, that looks like the core I need, an N258-48. And then what I can do uh, is take one of these, I have to desolder them to get them apart, take it apart. The only thing I need to check is the gap. So the material, I think I've got the material nailed down, uh, I need to confirm the gap. Um, there's an air gap inside here. These are sandwiched around a, a little coil of wire in there. There's an air gap. There's also an adjustable um, slug down the middle, a little ferrite slug. But I need to pull one apart, check the air gap, uh, and then I can order these. And they're like two bucks a piece or something, which isn't too bad. So I'll order a handful of those or a bucket full if I look around. Um, 
and then I can replace some of these smashed uh, cores on here. Uh, and the other things is uh, some of the, these capacitors are pretty chewed up, so I might find replacements. The rubber gaskets are falling out the ends of them, um, but the guts are good. Um, back when I had more time on my hands, I, I reverse engineered a few of these boards and worked out the schematics for them. Uh, and that kind of gave me some insight into how this system works, uh, especially looking at the digital side. So here's a fun one. This is uh, the QPJ97B Test Aid. So this board had a bunch of switches and things here, so you could um, plug it into your system, and this is kind of like the OBD connector for the system. It had a line that you could uh, try out here. Oh, I never even realized that. Um, on the front here, it has, here's a neat feature, it has a diode pin tester, so I could have stuck one of these diode pins in there. Well, there's probably dead bugs in there or something. Oh, there we go. Anyway, stick a dialed pin in, short, open, and a little ID would. Yeah, so this is a diagnostic card. This is more what uh, the logic cards would look like on the system. Um, these uh, IC jacks are actually used as test points. They all say TP something or another on them. And, and they're beaten up. Something's been living on here. Something gross. Um, this, you can see, there was uh, a lot of mines changing after they'd manufactured these boards. This is a later version of that same line card, the first card that we looked at here. Uh, this is a QPJ36A, what revision? Mm, style N, and the first one, style J. So J, K, L, M, N, yeah, they moved through some alphabet. Um, this appears to largely be an exercise in cost reduction. I like this style because from a reverse engineering standpoint, I can see everything. There isn't that big potted transformer dealio there. I can look at these things and, and tone out the windings and desolder them and figure out things about them. You know, when I have copious amounts of spare time, I can think about these things and never actually do them, which is good enough for me for the most part. So clearly this revision largely dealt with this, which I guess has a capacitor inside there as well. Ooh, this is a fun one. These two cards are both Digitone receivers. Same card, slightly different execution. So this one, date code 1975. This date code, 1978, found it right there. 75, 78, three year difference. Um, with thin film and some, uh, some degree of integration, those aren't standard 74 series. Those look like some kind of, I'm guessing PLL or something. Um, Whereas this board, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, interesting, uh, doesn't have that. Uh, these are 7402, 7400, 7401, 7401, 7400, logic, excuse me, nothing magical. Um, and then a whole bunch of, oh, I guess I should look at these magical things. Uh, all right, lots of fake data sheet links, but I couldn't find just on a quick search what a QMV1A is. But just an interesting comparison. Sorry, that one, that one. Um, between the two generations of board. All right, this one's only really interesting to telephone people, I guess, or even, not even then. Um, but this is the this card and this one right here, which I'm just being careful because the label's falling off. Actually, that's a good example of a label. Uh, QPJ69A, um, why does it say ETM? Uh, it's supposed to be ENM slash DX signaling trunk 10 pulse per second. Series C. ENM is a signaling standard used in analog phone systems um, for trunks. A trunk is a connection between two telephone systems. But anyway, uh, ENM is a kind of a complicated signaling method. Well, 
comparatively complicated. Um, there's a light bulb ballast in the bottom of the cabinet that's associated with these cards. Uh, ballast resistor. They're very analog, which is why there's lots of analogy stuff going on here. Anyway, that one I was excited about. Two of those. One's a bit more beaten up. I like having two of something though, because it means that I, if there's a smashed piece or a missing piece, that I can kind of cross check the two and figure out what I'm missing. Um, oh, what the heck? One more card. Digitone Sender QPJ68C. Uh, this is a less integrated style of electronics. Again, I have other Digitone cards in my systems that are more integrated than this. Some of them are big potted modules. Um, but this is a, a touch tone generator. Touch tone, DTMF, dual tone, multi frequency um, is actually a 4x4 matrix. Uh, in older dials, you can actually jam them and just get them to squeal out the one tone. Uh, so these, I'm guessing, are the the, f the X and Y columns of the thing, and these are these are some kind of Claire module. Oh, look at that the lid just slides on. They have a an inductor and a capacitor in there. And, who knows if they're tuned? Presumably they are, but they're all marked. Oh, there we go. 7906, 7907, 7906, 7907. Ah, it's just a date code. I'm an idiot. But you get it. There's they're pre-generating tones, digitone sender. Um, so yeah. Those are, it's a tiny glimpse into the guts of a Northern Telecom SG-1 PBX, uh, PABX. They called it an EPABX. Again, they were really playing up this whole electronic thing. Um, so one of my systems I'm giving away, so I wanted to actually measure the cards. Can we see that? That's better. These are what? Eight and just shy of seven eighths? By eight. Yeah. Eight and thirteen sixteenths to be exact. Yes. For my metric friends, that's eight and thirteen sixteenths times uh, twenty five point four millimeters. Made in Canada. A eh? Ex warranty expires. Warranty expires July of 1981. Mm. I think the warranty also expired when Nortel uh, crashed and burned and went out of business. Unfortunately. Well, that's fun. Northern Telecom, Northern Telecom, Northern Electric. Uh, I, I've never seen this logo before. It's made in USA. Most of my cards came from Canada. I say that. These came from the States. My systems that I have came from Canada. Uh, so, um, the earliest stuff is all Northern Electric. All their manuals are branded that. Because um, that's who they were. They were Northern Electric. Uh, and then they ended up being NT, Northern Telecom, for the longest time. Um, this logo, just some intermediate. I don't know. That's a very brief glimpse into... Uh, that system. See you later. You'll notice that these boards all have gold contacts on them. If um, you're one of those kind of people who likes to post on YouTube comments like, you could make money by salvaging the gold out of those contacts, just go away. I don't want to hear about it. Thanks.